we need to congratulate a lot of people, uh, also Cristiano Figueres and the Mexican government, uh, for actually saving the, the global top-down, uh, the multilateral climate change process, because that's really important. Uh, but also we know um, that there's still a long way to go. And I think um, yeah, we will focus, of course, on what steps we need to take and why and how we're going to do that. Uh, but let's also not forget to um, to stand still at the good news, because the good news is if you look at everything, even the undercurrents in the US and actually globally, the direction is unstoppable. So I'm deeply convinced the direction is unstoppable. But the bad news is we are still going too slow and with too little. So in that sense, then also, also looking at the audience here, our challenge is to increase the momentum. And if you look at it and if you divide the population and roughly <clears throat> roughly in three parts, and there are 10 to 20 percent of innovators. I mean, in this case, we can also call them eco-innovators. Huh? That's also a work stream in the Lisbon Council, but truly eco-innovators. So that's us. And we no longer need further convincing because we, we know huh, all the benefits and why we need to do this. There's also a group of 10 to 20 percent, you can call them eco-laggards, and they will not move. So the battle will be won huh, by those who capture not only the minds, but also the hearts of the large group in the middle. Uh, the eco-majority, 50 to 70 percent. And my view is that we need to do three things additionally or more, huh, or that we haven't done before, to capture the minds and the hearts of this eco-majority. One is we need to broaden the scope of the whole debate. So just from climate change, like the Commission also indicated, to resource efficiency, thereby making it a holistic agenda <clears throat> that also looks at jobs and growth and everything uh, but particularly what is happening with energy, energy is just the first resource where an issue like this pops up. Uh, we see the same with raw materials, water, food. Uh, so there's, there's a broad, holistic resource efficiency challenge that actually, when we tackle it, has wide benefits. The second thing that, that we need to do is actually address what I call the communication challenge. I'll have a few words on, on that. Uh, but basically what we need to do with the communication challenge is we need to move away from talking about global threats to tangible individual benefits. Uh, so global threats is enough for the eco-innovators, uh, but the eco-majority, they need to see simple, tangible benefits for themselves. I'll, I'll come back to that. And the third thing that we need to do much more is to cooperate in implementation initiatives. So to cooperate in implementation. So that means moving from paper to practice, but also jointly. So one reflection I had in Cancun was actually at one of the interviews I did at the end of the conference and said it's actually uh, one day, uh, maybe a couple of years from now, we'll reflect back because we see in Cancun, uh, for those who were there, uh, there was quite a distance also geographically between three sites. One side you had the politicians, another side you had most of the NGOs and business, uh, they were mostly in the hotel strip and having side events. And apart from me being in business and apart from the commissioner being a politician, we're also, most of us are parents, we're all citizens, we're all voters, we're all consumers, huh? so we're in this together. So I think also there, huh, my plea would be to cooperate in implementation initiatives. I'll give a few, few examples, a huh? few, few words huh, to each of those three points. <clears throat> so one, to broaden the scope. Um, I think that also, if you broaden the scope, the, I think the key message that I would like to give to you is that when you look at climate change, resource efficiency, we need to take a step back. If we want to be successful in solving this, we need to take a step back and to see what is really the core of the problem. And my view is the core of the problem is that over the past decades, we have created a society that is optimized on lowest initial cost. So for everything we do, looking at price tags, the process of our behavior, the processes we have, I look at procurement, uh, municipal procurement, everything drives down initial price uh, through tender processes, but also with the way we judge things <clears throat> as voters, media, look at the midterm elections, everybody's after instant gratification. So what is actually happening with energy uh, most visibly, but also, uh, also happening in certain areas already with raw materials and food and water, is that the, the integral, the life cycle bill, economical, ecological and social, is being pushed by us into the future. And we see, first of all, we can no longer pay that bill today, let alone huh, that the next generations can afford it. We can't, because we're living off their future. So what we need to do, huh, we need to move from, an, let's say, this lowest initial cost focus, which actually 
And a way to look at it is that we are the only species that live in a linear society. The one end we consume, and the other end have we exhaust, and we create a waste. And some of us think that the amount of waste is a sense of, of prosperity. So we need to move to a circular society. And not just because of all the ecological effects, which are true and which I deeply believe in, but simply wasting less resources makes your products and your services more competitive. But also, it will help you making, let's say, enjoying many of its wider benefits, because the economical, ecological part is there. And that, that brings me to the second part, the communication part. So yes, we need to talk about global threats, but to capture it, the, the, the hearts of the eco-majority, they are not going to read the next letter to the Prime Minister or the big reports that some of us make, and we too. They need simple communication. So indeed, for part, it's in terminology, like circular society. <clears throat> but I'll give you one example, and it relates to lighting. So with lighting, uh, I think many of you know how we have been running, I, st I started at the end of 2003, a global program, also as an industry, and actually with many of you, to switch uh, from inefficient to energy efficient lighting. It saves a lot of resources, more than 120 billion euro globally, more than 600 million tons of carbon, more than 600 power plants, which by the way, by the way, is also had less one trillion euro investment in power infrastructure. And we have spoken with large countries, small countries, Russia, Lebanon, everybody, and they get it. And quite often we don't talk about climate change. Again, I deeply believe in it, but they see the economic rationale. <clears throat> but then, if we move beyond the monetary and the ecological savings and we look at actually what is this lighting really for? Let me take one example, the example of schools. We've done a number of pilots in Germany, Belgium and in Holland. And actually one, the first one in Hamburg was studied by the University of Hamburg. We changed the lighting in energy efficient lighting, but also lighting that could very easily change the tone of whites and the intensity depending on what those children were doing. However, they had a concentrating thing to do, reading, writing, spelling, and you could change the setting. Like just in nature, also the, the tone and the intensity of light varies. So that's quite natural. And what they found is, yes, they could save 50% of energy. Yes, they could save a lot of money and CO2. But most importantly, the learning effectiveness increased. So reading speeds went up by 30 40%. Spelling mistakes went down by 30 Children were less restless. Also, teachers are more likely to reach retirement age. So what I'm saying is, if we, if we focus on these benefits, uh, this is what a school understands. And somebody will check the bill, huh? uh, the energy bill. But most of all, we see now a number of schools. Huh? There you see momentum coming up. It was even on the Dutch news. But then, looking at communication, there's an important message. Because we could talk about, hey, great, this is a low carbon school. But then again, had the eco-majority, huh? whom of those parents huh, will send their kids to a low carbon school? Low carbon? Huh? Something must be wrong. The second thing that you could do is, let's call it a green school. We even use that term, or a sustainable school. OK, it sounds interesting. But to some, particularly in the US, this may sound like a political choice. But then we talk about it in our marketing efforts as a bright school, because it's all about the learning. So what I'm saying, you can do the same thing in terms of resource efficiency, but the language makes a huge difference. So we need to move from global threats to tangible benefits, like with the school example, and many, many more when you translate things in well-being, productivity, safety in the city, traffic flow, huh? even this morning, huh? if that can be improved. Uh, so, and the third one, had the cooperation in implementation. Oh, maybe one, one word there, also coming back to the commissioner. Uh, we've become very successful in creating this linear society because we, the key performance indicator is GDP. So everything we consume adds up, and then that's, that's the measure. So indeed, if we talk about the benefits, the tangible benefits like learning effectiveness, that also is a, is a, let's say, a quality of life, of life factor. So I think the GDP needs to be substituted. It's not going to be easier by quality of life. And then the third thing, I see Paul looking at me, probably because of time, is on cooperation. So we, again, we can, we can preach, we, we, we should celebrate, communicate these examples, but our, our call is also to collectively create more initiatives. Because if we have initiatives, then the citizens will see it, and through their voting and buying behavior, they will push us and they will create the momentum. And so, for instance, agreeing collectively, have public private sector combined to renovate all the schools in Europe or all public offices. Those are the most inefficient. Anyway, and so also there on cooperation and, and thinking about the time, there's one thing that I would like to say. And it, it's not my saying, but I think that, that I felt was really also applicable to COP16. 
If you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. So I think it makes all the sense in the world huh, to pursue this resource efficiency agenda, to, to leverage huh, the, the power of communication in this partnership, in this wider co cooperation huh, that we have not yet seen before. Thank you.